Good morning and welcome to today's webinar about Grant Writing 101. My name is Severia and I'm the Communications Manager for Transforming Youth Outdoors, also known as TYO. TYO was created to scale the impact of outdoor youth development and transform the lives of youth by providing best practices, tools, and support to individuals and organizations working with youth. We are a technology platform that enables those in the field of outdoor youth programming to learn, share, network, and build upon successes. Membership to TYO is free and you can sign up at mytyo.org. And our webinar series is just one of the many ways that TYO connects you to experts and valuable learning opportunities. It is my pleasure to welcome back Ivan from the Outdoor Foundation. As the Deputy Director of the Outdoor Foundation, Ivan is the perfect person to be leading the Grants 101 webinar. And whether you work with youth or just work in outdoor programs, this is gonna be a valuable uh, webinar. So we're excited that you can join us. And Ivan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Severia, and thank you, TYO, for having me today. Uh, I'm really excited about this, this webinar because it really came out of a need. You know, it was everybody, all of you out there um, that are listening, that really kind of voiced to TYO and even to, to myself at different times. You know, knowing about the opportunities are great, but just knowing what the mindset is of someone that reviews grants um, would be awesome and some help just on a grant writing 101 kind of things to think about when putting together a grant proposal. So thank you all for expressing that need uh, and thank you TYO for having me today. Uh, as Severia mentioned, my name is Ivan Levin. I'm the deputy director of the Outdoor Foundation uh, and I have been with the Outdoor Foundation for seven years now and I oversee all of the foundation's grant making, um, youth engagement and activation programs as well as many of our strategic partnerships. Uh, in previous positions, I've been with the National Park Foundation and the American Hiking Society. Um, and in my free time, I'm also an adjunct faculty member at George Mason University with the School of Recreation, Health and Tourism. So what is the Outdoor Foundation? The quick and easy answer is that the Outdoor Foundation is the philanthropic arm and the nonprofit of the outdoor industry. So the outdoor industry has a trade association called the Outdoor Industry Association. And I'm very proud to be their nonprofit arm. We are dedicated to inspiring and growing future generations of outdoor leaders and enthusiasts. We do this through groundbreaking research, youth engagement, and community grant making. Um, and we also work to mobilize and to create a major cultural shift that leads to all Americans connecting with the great outdoors. In the past seven years, the Outdoor Foundation has invested more than $5 million in nearly 900 not for profit um, program, and not for profit and college programs. And we've connected more than 260,000 young people to the outdoors. Um, and this number is not there, but I personally read thousands of grant applications a year. So hopefully some of that insight will be really valuable for you today. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump in and they'll um, definitely type your questions into the, the menu bar and we'll, we'll be sure to tackle those at the end of today's webinar. So with further ado, we'll get started. So what is a grant? Um, a grant is a conditional gift or a conveyance of funds with strings attached. Meaning it's not just money that you get and typically you never hear from the grantor again. It's um, funding that you receive because you have said in some sort of proposal or application that you're going to do something for the funds that are received. The funding source typically identifies a problem that is um, needed to be addressed, uh, but the outcome isn't known. And so that's why typically there are grant applications the problems thrown out there and through the applications and program solutions, that's how the best projects are identified and funding is released. And the idea originates from the grantee. So typically with a traditional grant, the grantor doesn't say, this is what we're looking for, write it X, Y, Z. That's more of a sponsorship. Typically, again, the challenge is thrown out there and the idea originates from the nonprofit in this case. Um, and really, again, come the nonprofit comes to the table with the solution to a problem. So um, one thing I wanna mention before we go any further is that all of the information that I'm providing today is from the perspective of Ivan at the Outdoor Foundation. So please take that for what it's worth and also recognize that the world that I live in is focused around environmental and outdoor grant making. And we are kind of a different type of foundation than your typical family foundation. So please just um, take that, um, keep that in mind that everything you're hearing today is through the perspective of the Outdoor Foundation, but might be different in other funding scenarios. 
So from the 10,000 foot level, who gives money and why? So there's obviously the federal government. So the federal government gives and takes away funding dollars based typically on political agenda, more so now in our current political environment than ever before. Typically with federal grants, they tell you what they want you to do, and then you create a proposal that meets those exact and specific um, X, Y, Z instructions. It typically can be a very slow review process. You could be waiting years for funding. Um, so that's your federal dollars. There's a state level to funding. Um, little money is typically given for basic research. It's often good for projects that are working with students and young people. Um, and typically it's used to outsource work when budgets decrease from the um, state government. But even when they have money, they won't tell you about it. So really looking into the funding opportunities that you have on a state level, I encourage all of you to do. They're typically the funding opportunities that are behind the curtain. So it takes a little bit of research to find out what those state funding opportunities are. Uh, kind of going the next level down, private foundations, which is more of the world that I'm working in. Private foundations typically give out of the goodness of their heart. So typically there's a specific mission or purpose to the uh, reason behind the grant opportunity. Usually it's to advance a specific particular cause. Again, in our world, what we're talking about today, typically that's around outdoor participation or engagement. Um, in the United States, typically there's about $10 billion given annually through private foundations. So definitely take the time to research what are the private foundations in your local region, um, family foundations, other types of foundations, but a lot of them give locally. So definitely do your research to see what types of local private foundations are available to you. Oftentimes, again, they give geographically. Um, and also in the world of private foundations, only about $1 billion typically goes out to university initiatives. And as I mentioned, they often fund geographically. Uh, the next level down is kind of your corporate corporate type of giving. Um, and we I delve in this world as well. Typically, they're given to give some sort of self-enlightened self-interest. Uh, they're looking to improve the quality of life for their consumers or, or base demographic. A lot of times they get um, recommendations from employment pools. Uh, it's often done to improve their public image, which maybe sounds negative, but isn't. And then oftentimes the corporation or the brand wants to be able to say, we help you do great things and this is how we do it. So that's a lot of the reasons behind why corporations give funding. Uh, I do feel that the Outdoor Foundation is a hybrid of private foundation and representing corporate giving. As many of you might know from the Outdoor Foundation, uh, most of the grant dollars that we give out are actually brand related dollars that we manage the grant um, program for. So for example, the North Face gives out $500,000 a year. That is a public brand facing North Face grant program that we manage. Um, so we add in the private foundation element, but we also um, represent the corporation and the brand. So we really are a hybrid, a private foundation and corporation. So the grant process is never wasted. So before we kind of get into the details of what a typical grant application looks like and what we look for, um, I just wanted to set the stage um, or kind of get into the minds of everybody on this call. So number one, oftentimes people feel like, especially after getting declined multiple, multiple times, which is definitely the, the world that I'm sure many of you live in, um, it's never wasted. So never kind of get that mindset or get to that place where you feel like no matter what you do, you're never gonna get that grant because it will pay off one day eventually. Typically grants aren't given overnight. So it, it's, a, it's a process and a learning process. Um, it, it can't get, um, you can't get a grant unless you write one and it's not expected to be easy. So the worst thing that you can do is never try. And I mention this because I know personally um, and probably many of you on the, on the phone, you're gonna get 10 declinations to the one approval that you might get. And so just kind of knowing that, you know, it's you're investing and every grant that you get a no for, there's one out there that's going to tell you yes. So recognizing that it's not an easy process. So to throw that, that as far away from your mindset as possible. Um, it can be professionally fulfilling. So when you do get that grant, it is going to make you feel amazing 
Amazing. So just keep that feeling in mind because it will be a really fulfilling moment for you professionally. So keep trying. Remember, every no you get, write two more grant applications um, because it will get you to a funding source eventually. Um, the grant process does require you to really focus your thoughts and should be written for projects that you really know well. So if you're a grant writer, talk to your program people. Talk to the people if you're not that person that really knows the ins and outs of this program idea or the program if it's been implemented in the past. Writing a grant proposal really allows you to focus your thoughts, focus elements of the program, and get specific in your goals and objectives. So talk to the people that know the project well and every grant writer should know the project as well as the program officer. So really kind of keep that in mind and to the best of your ability, get to know the projects that you're writing grants for. Um, also the grant process helps you refine future proposals. So for every no that you get, see if you can get feedback. If it's general feedback, if it's specific feedback, it doesn't matter. It's going to help you refine future proposals in the future, right, future proposals in the future. So obviously, so make sure that um, you really take the comments and the feedback and that helps you um, moving forward. Um, also, the grant process gives you good language and messaging that you can use in areas outside of the grant. I can tell you again from personal experience that a lot of times language that I personally will put into funding proposals or, or other types of grant applications I use in board reports. I use when I'm talking to other funders. Um, it's sometimes it's great for a website or social media, depending on your tone and voice. So really take the chance to make an amazing grant proposal, because even if it's declined, it allows you to get great language and messaging about your program that you can use in other places outside of that grant proposal. And remember, there are lots of amazing fund worthy projects that go unfunded with every grant program. It wouldn't be called a grant program if every single applicant got the money. So always recognize that there's never enough resources for every fund worthy proposal and don't let that deter you. You know, that's just kind of the name of the game that you're going to get declined way more than you get approved and you are not alone. Many amazing, awesome, impactful programs don't get funded because usually there's never enough funding and resources to go around. So just always keep that in mind because I hear that a lot from people. My program was the perfect fit. It definitely was the perfect fit. I wish there were more, re more resources to go around. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're going through the grant process. A couple of keys to success to keep in mind. Innovation and creativity are important. For anyone that reads grant applications, and as I mentioned, I read thousands a year, the ones that are really innovative and creative, the ones that really separate themselves from the pack are the ones that end up making it further down the grant review process. So take the time to add innovation and creativity. Take the time to take a program and how can you add a layer of innovation to it or change one element of that program to make it fresh or make it relevant to the populations that you're serving or relevant to things that are happening in society. You know, what are ways that you can really add innovation and creativity to a project that you've currently been running or a new project that you're trying to get off the ground? Be specific and detailed in your grant application with some light, colorful language added. Everything in moderation. So, you know, I always tell people a, a lot of times in grant applications, it's either too dry, you know, it feels like you're reading a research report, or it's so heavy on the descriptive fluffy kind of colorful language that you lose the real details of what the program is doing and what the grantee uh, uh, post applicant is asking for. So really use um, everything in moderation, you know, some good specific detailed information with some light descriptive colorful language. Um, don't go heavy on one side or the other. Don't go too far into the why, focus more on the how. So again, this is another thing that I want to mention specifically in my world. You know, we know why it's important to get people connected to the outdoors. We know why it's important to give young people access to outdoor education. We know why it's important that young people get connected to the outdoors now in order to be future outdoors, conservationists, um, so on and so forth. 
So we don't need you to go too far into the why in an application. We want you to focus on the how. How are you going to tackle the problem or challenge that the grant program is trying to tackle? Um, you know, don't go into why we need to connect kids to the outdoors. We know why we need to connect to the kids to the outdoors. So talk about the how. Make sure that when you're preparing your budget, that it actually reflects the narrative. Many times when I'm looking at grant applications, you have these amazing proposals that really talk about why this program is happening and how they're going to tackle these issues of getting people connected to the outdoors or um, getting involved in environmental issues. But um, then you go to the budget and the budget is asking for something totally different than what, what you see in the narrative. So really take the time to make sure that your budget reflects what's in the narrative and the narrative reflects what's in the budget. Okay, so some reasons why proposals fail deadline not met you are not alone everybody waits so the last 24 hours to get their grant application in there's a deadline for a reason um so make sure that you're meeting that deadline you know life happens technology happens internet happens and a million other reasons there is a deadline for a reason there are plenty of people that are able to meet that deadline so even though you think that you're special just recognize that deadlines are there for a reason and oftentimes we cannot break that deadline if you don't meet it. Guidelines aren't followed. Simple things like um, character counts, word counts, answering questions, answering the question that you're supposed to be answering. Oftentimes simple guidelines are not followed. Um, nothing intriguing or innovative. And you know that when you're writing the proposal. You know, if you're like, eh, this application's kind of meh, then that's how the reviewer is going to feel about that application. So take the time to use that fresh perspective and add things that really um, make your application intriguing, innovative, outside of the box, separate from the pack. You know, what's gonna make this different from the other 500 applications that have submitted or 100 applications that have been submitted for this grant program? Um, did not meet priority. So that's another kind of general look at the criteria for the grant. You know, make sure that you're meeting the audience criteria. Make sure you're eating the prior priorities or requirements of the program itself. You would be surprised how many people just submit grant proposals because they can, but they don't take the couple of seconds to change the wording to make sure that you're using words that you see in the RFP, for example, the request for a proposal. So Take the time to make sure that you're meeting priorities and you're adjusting your language to match the language being used in the funding information. Uh, not completing, not answering questions completely, being too brief in your responses. Um, a lot of people you know, use paragraphs when they should be bulleting and then bullet when they're supposed to be using paragraphs. So you know, again, everything in moderation, make sure that you're answering questions completely. Um, and as I mentioned previously, unrealistic budgets. You know, going out for a $5,000 grant when the budget is really $200,000, most funders are not going to contribute to that because there's not enough for that funder to, to own, quote unquote. And I just mean, you know, really have an impactful role in the success of that program. So make sure that your budget, again, reflects the narrative, but also make sure that it's realistic um, for what you're asking for within your application. The cost is greater than the benefit. So make sure that the, the amount that you're asking for meets the benefits that you're looking to deliver to your participants. I'll tell you a great, great math equation. Divide the number of the amount of money that you have by the number of people you're trying to serve. You know, look at the cost per participant. You know, make sure that it's not costing $100 for one kid to get outside two times. Because that's really hard as a funder to say, well, I'm going to fund this over another program where it costs $15 per participant to have an equal type of meaningful experience. So make sure that your budget, again, really reflects not only the narrative, but that the cost per participant and the cost um, you know, matches the benefits you're trying to deliver. Uh, poorly written, proof reading. You know, when you're reading 500 applications, if someone has blatant spelling errors or blatant um, things in the application that weren't correct, did due to peer review or just proofreading your work, um, that is an automatic no for a lot of in a lot of cases. So poorly written proposals simply
simply not taking the time to proofread oftentimes will help will um, not help your proposal. Uh, defensiveness. So when you do get declined, many people take the defensive and I hear this a lot. Everyone takes it very personally because most people in our field are very mission driven and people automatically feel like, well, you didn't like my program. There's something wrong with my program and I know it's awesome. And the truth is, is that you're always going to think your program is the best but someone that has to give your program funding is looking at lots of other equal type of programs competing for funding. So never be defensive in email or on any, in any type of communication that you're having with the program officer or grantor. All right, so let's jump into the process a little bit. So one, every good grant proposal starts with a good idea. You also wanna make sure that not only you have a good idea, but your good idea is a good institutional fit. You know, make sure that you're not one of the organizations that's listed under we do not fund. Um, make sure that who you are as an organization, your mission matches or is in the same world as the mission and, and philosophy of the organization or, or corporation or brand that's trying to fund you. So make sure that it's a good institutional fit. Assemble a winning team. Grant writing should never be done by one individual. You should have other people review the review the applications or, or grant proposals, even if you're the best grant writer in the world. Talk to the people that are implementing the program. Talk to your executive directors or management team. You know, have multiple eyes on the proposal to make sure that it everybody feels good about it moving forward and representing that organization. Um, and, and program. So assemble a winning team. It's always good to collaborate. Match the idea to a sponsor. So not only a good institutional fit for the organization, but also making sure that it's a good um, idea that you're putting forth that would be a good match for the funding sponsor or partner. Read the guidelines. Always, always, always read the guidelines specifically. Many people um, overlook details details and that puts them out of the running for different types of funding opportunities. Read the guidelines again. Read them every time you're writing a, a grant proposal. If you've ever applied for a job, you know, you write your cover letter based on the job description. It's the same thing. Write your grant application based on the RFP or the information page about the grant. Use similar wording. Make sure that you're specifically writing to criteria and requirements in that inf grant information. Um, always keep those guidelines open. Every time you're in your grant proposal before you submit, keep looking at those guidelines and make sure that this winning team that you've put together also have reviewed the guidelines as well. Reach out with questions. So make sure that if you have a good valid question that you cannot find the answer for by again, reading the guidelines, reach out to the funding officer um, whether that's someone like me at the Outdoor Foundation or a more traditional funding officer or program officer at a, at a more traditional foundation, but reach out with questions to make sure that your proposal will be as strong as possible. Plan in detail. So make sure that you are really thinking about your program from beginning to end, not only where the idea came from, but how it will be implemented and how you will evaluate it and all the details that go into each one of those steps, and then how you create awareness around this amazing program that you've developed. So really think about the full program cycle as you're writing your program or your grant proposal or application. Develop the budget from the detailed plan. So make sure that when you get to the budget part of the proposal, which typically is not the first thing you do, um, make sure that you develop it from the plan that you have dictated in the narrative of the proposal. Read the guidelines again with the narrative in mind. Again, and make sure that your narrative is matching the language being used in the guidelines or the RFP. And be persistent. Revise, 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 and resubmit if and when you have the opportunity to. Oftentimes, that is not something that I deal with, is asking people to resubmit applications, but there are plenty of foundations that will say, you know, we love the kernel of this idea, but you're not quite there. Take advantage of the opportunities 
to revise and resubmit. It's okay to be persistent um, in moderation with the people that are managing these grant programs. Okay, so it all starts with an idea. An idea is something that only exists in your mind. So you have to be able to take this good idea and put it onto paper. And that's not easy for everyone to do. So again, make sure you have that winning team in place that allows you to take all of the details of this idea and get it down to paper to a pretty robust, almost program plan. That's essentially what you're doing is a version of a program plan within the grant application. Your task is to present that idea and a fundable proposal. So the grant writer has to do, has a really important task of taking an idea that oftentimes people are really passionate about and turn that passion into something that's actually fundable um, and kind of keep that in mind. You know, is this something that's actually fundable, not just, oh, it feels good and we should do it. Um, and that's a kind of a different perspective than just, we should just do it because it's the right thing to do versus it's the right thing to do. And this is a really fundable idea. There are elements to my idea that allow a funder to really tap into, whether that's communications, on the ground implementations, um, engaging that funder in events. There's lots of ways that you can add elements that make your idea more fundable than maybe someone else's. Take a vague idea and identify a specific problem or need associated with it. So again, taking that idea and be able to really match it up to a specific problem or need that's being um, talked about in that RFP or grant information page. You know, again, typically we come out with the problem is more young people need to get active to the outdoors or more young people, <coughs> excuse me, need access to outdoor education or more young people need a climbing wall. Whatever it might be, think about what that specific need and problem is and make sure that you're addressing that specifically in this idea that you've created. So is it the right grant opportunity for you? You know, one, when you're looking at federal funding opportunities, are you eligible? Oftentimes there's a matching component um, to the federal funding opportunities. Are you actually able to meet that match? How many projects are funded through this funding opportunity is always something um, good to know. How much money is actually available? You know, is it worth, is there enough money to go around? Is it worth your time and investment? You know, all questions that you have to decide within your organization. Um, are you willing to change what your idea is to meet the guidelines of the federal funding opportunity? And a lot of times, and I deal with that all the time, I get a lot of funding from the National Park Service. So we have to kind of think about, hey, do I want to change what our goals of the program are to meet the guidelines of the funding opportunity? Is it worth it? Does it make sense? And the answer sometimes is no, and that's okay. When you're dealing with private funding opportunities, um, one is their institutional advancement. So is it helping this institute advance their mission? Are there geographic um, parameters? So for example, one of the grants that I manage, um, typically I do national. Sometimes I do global in Canada. Um, with a recent PRANA funding opportunity, it was six specific markets across the United States. So look at, are there any geographic or regional limitations? Who do they want to fund? Is it nonprofits? Is it colleges and universities? Um, is it land trusts? Is it everybody? You know, who are they looking to fund? That's important, obviously, to, to look into and investigate. What is the range of funding that's available? And what is the timeline of the grant? What type of projects are they looking to fund? Is it infrastructure? Or is it capital investments? Is it on the ground programming? You know, what type of projects are eligible under these private funding opportunity? Is it kids outdoors? Is it environmental education? Is it conservation and land easements? You know, there's a, a lot of different things that you can fund in the environmental and outdoor world. Make sure that what you're looking for is actually what the funder is looking to fund. Make sure that, again, that change to meet priorities. Are you willing to change elements of the program to meet funding prior or priorities of the funder? Um, sometimes the answer is yes, because it makes sense. Sometimes the answer is no. And again, that's okay. And as someone that is a funder, um, I appreciate it when people can kind of say, you know, this wasn't quite right for us, but I can't wait for the next funding opportunity. 
I remember those organizations. Let's see, a couple more questions to ask when looking at an RFP or a request for proposals, the grant information page or document. Does the funding agency share your goals? Obviously, you want to make sure that the goals that you have for your organization and program match the needs of the funding agency. Is the funding agency interested in the same populations that you're serving? Again, a lot of times, a lot of people will throw out the word um, underserved or uh, minority, or there's all, all sorts of different terms that people use within these funding opportunities, but don't just use a term underserved without really being able to show how you're reaching an underserved or um, low income or other type of population. Has the funding agency funded projects similar to yours? You know, a lot of times I work on project or programs that are brand new funding opportunities, so there isn't a place to point to. But for many other funding opportunities, there's been lots of historical data on what projects have been funded and how they met the priorities of the organization. So do your research. Don't call the funding officer or the, program, the, the person in charge of the grant program and ask them to send you information about previous grantees. Look for the information on your own. If it's out there, it will live online somewhere, somehow through a Google search. Don't be afraid to Google it. You'd be amazed at the information you can find by doing just a little bit of research on your own. Have they made awards to institutions similar to yours? Does the agency require any matching? And where will the award, when will the award be made? So really thinking about, you know, I'm doing winter activities, but this is a, a grant for summer. So that might not align or vice versa, or I'm looking to get um, kids specifically connected to a type of activity, um, but we're looking to fund outdoor education. So it might not be a good match. So make sure you look to see when those awards are actually being made. Follow the guidelines. You have to follow the guidelines exactly. They're there for a reason. Make sure that you're responding to all sections of a grant application Typically, those things are automatically required, so you can't move forward in the grant, but make sure that you're responding to all sections. Adhere to any format restrictions, character um, limitations, etc. Make sure that the to topics covered in your application are covered, um, topics must be covered in order, um, in the order that they're presented in the guidelines. So just make sure that you're touching again on all the different elements presented in that RFP. Use language that corresponds to the guidelines, as I previously mentioned. So just like a cover letter and a job application, use language that comes from that RFP. Some technical issues to consider before you write. Is there a conflict of interest um, within your organization? What is the submission process? Is it online? Is it facts, which I hope it's not facts? Is it mailing in? You know, what is the way for you to submit your application? Is it through a Google form? Is it through grant software like Cyber Grants or Foundant or some other type of grant management software? Do you need to create an account? All those things are important. What's the due date? Not only the due date, specifically the time and time zone. Depending on where your funder is based, sometimes it ends at midnight Eastern Standard Time. Sometimes it's 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 12 a.m. Pacific Time. So make sure that you know your due dates, your times, and your time zones. Again, the character limits, make sure that you're aware of those. I always get questions about character limits. They're there for a reason. Um, if there are specific financials required, tax forms required, make sure that you have access to those and are submitting those in a timely fashion. If it's the day of, of and you can't track down your finance officer, um, you're gonna miss your deadline. So make sure you take the time to track that down and make sure you're aware of letters of support are required or, or not. I'll tell you that Typically, um, when grants are $15,000 or less, a lot of times in my world, letters of support aren't required because there's just not enough time to read every letter of support. When a funder is looking to give more larger dollars, $20,000, $25,000, so on and so forth, that's when typically letters of support are required. If you don't see a letter of support required, don't email and say, I've got a letter of support. I'd love to give it to you. Because naturally the person's gonna say, yes, sure, we'll take your letter of support and then it's never going to get read. So is that part of the process? If it is, there's a reason. If it's not, 
there's a reason. So kind of respect that process. Appropriate writing style. Write to the funding source and know your audience. Write in the correct language of the field, but don't use jargon. Never write in first person. Always write in third person when you're putting together a grant application. Make sure that there's plenty of clarity in the words that you're using. Make sure that you're writing to inform someone about the great work that you're doing. Don't use language that is biased. Even in, especially today in a political climate, you might assume that the funder that you're going out after may be aligned with your political values, but that's not always the case. So make sure that not, you're not using biased language. Write to persuade as well as, as inform the person controlling the funding program. Make sure that you're using data from a reputable source. Use current data, not data that's um, not relevant or timely. And make sure that you're able to establish credibility within the data or specific um, research that you're quoting or using in your grant proposal. Um, and just don't add your own opinions and the grant proposal. Remember, you're representing the organization, not yourself as an individual. So what keeps us from actually doing grants? Fear meaning going after grants. Fear of rejection. You know, everyone is afraid of rejection, but you're going to get a lot more rejection than acceptance um, when you're writing grants. So that's just kind of the, the, the nature of the, the way it is. The reality that only one proposal in five is turned down because the idea wasn't good enough. So that means four other proposals are being declined out of five because there just isn't enough funding to go around. It's not because it wasn't a good idea. Reality, a rejected proposal is worth about $10,000 of free advice. So don't take your declination as a negative. Take it as a way to learn and improve. Reality, the success rate is higher for proposals that turn in a second proposal with changes versus um, going out, you know, getting that grant right out of the gate. And the success rate on a third submission is typically one to one. That's not always true, but in the grant world, um, that's kind of a general rule. So third time's a charm, not necessarily always true, I will, I will admit. All right, so a grant is not an idea. It is is a plan as I, I've dictated, so or as I mentioned. So the idea, you have to turn this idea into a specific program plan that gets to objectives and goals and an evaluation and how you're really gonna be successful. So different parts of a grant application to be aware of, the title, the abstract, the description, the populations being served, goals, narrative, metrics, the budget, the type of request, whether it's in-kind or financial, the timeline, letters of support if applicable, and then miscellaneous, miscellaneous assets like photos and videos that might be required. So I'm gonna talk about each of these briefly. So the title, the title is important, make it catchy. If you name your proposal scholarships for underserved youth, you're not going to get funded. You know, take a few minutes to make your title catchy, different than what everyone else is making their titles. You know, try to be as creative as possible. A title goes a long way. And it should also convey what the project is about within the title. Um, a lot of times some titles are so ambiguous that you don't really know what the, what the program is um, generally from the title itself. So take the time to have a good title. And it's often used to assign review groups. So a reviewer, can get a lot of information just from the title, meaning what type of project are they proposing? The abstract, it should stand alone. The abstract is your one paragraph elevator pitch. It is the place that should stand alone and it should be able within a couple sentences to talk about what your program is, how you're gonna do it and why it's gonna be successful. It may be all that a reviewer reads. When you're reading a lot of applications, if the abstract doesn't get to what the program is, um, it might be overlooked. So take the time to really have an awesome standalone abstract that really gives a good um, summary of what your program is all about. Make sure that it's um, publishable, meaning use that abstract. That might be what ends up on a website where once you're funded and the funder is talking about the, the types of programs they're funding, that abstract, might be is what might be what's getting used to talk about your program socially or online. So make sure that it's um, publishable quality. 
Make sure your abstract is clear, concise, and only one paragraph. Again, you want to avoid first person and do not refer to the proposal um, in the abstract itself. And cover all elements in order. So one to two sentences per section of your full application. So if you have a sentence or two on every um, element or section of the application itself, you're going to have a pretty good summary um, that a funder can use um, or read to really understand what your, your proposal is all about. So make sure that you encompass all elements. You talk about budget. You talk about timeline. You talk about narrative all within this abstract summary. And you should also write that abstract last. So even though it's really important, you should really go through all of the other steps of your proposal and then go back and write your abstract. So make that the last thing that you write. The project description. It is critically important and often poorly written. Convince the funding source that you understand the need and can help them solve the problem and be the solution. Make sure that you're providing a detailed overview of your project or program and make sure that you're specific in describing all of the participation elements. Don't spend too much time on the need, focus on the how. Again, typically in, in the world that we live in, we know what the need is, so talk about how you're gonna combat that challenge or problem that's been proposed. Know your populations that are being served. A lot of times in, in the programs that I manage, the grant applications that I work with, you need to know who you're serving and and why it's important to work with that community. And I think if people automatically think about race, but I encourage you to think about type of activity, think about economics, think about sexual orientation, race, ethnicity. You know, there's lots of ways that you can describe a population and get to diversity. Don't just think about it as the color of someone's skin or where they're from. So I really encourage you to know the populations that you're serving and know those population statistics. Know the age demographics, the ethnicity, the race, and other numbers that can um, provide statistics on the populations you're trying to serve. Oftentimes, you'll see grant applications ask for goals or goals and objectives. Both goals and objectives should flow logically from the narrative of the description. So based on the description that you're providing, there should be clear goals or objective statements that come out of that. Goals convey the ultimate intent of the proposed project. Um, a concise statement of, oops, sorry about that. Uh, a concise statement of the whole purpose of the project. The opening statement of this section should literally begin with the goal of this project is to um, make it simple for your reviewer. You know, a lot of times when I have to dig for information in a question that should be pretty straightforward, um, oftentimes you don't have time to do that with every proposal. So make sure if we're asking for goals that you literally say the goal of this project is and then start listing your goals out. Um, you know, be specific and detailed here. And it's really good practice to write your goal statements as smart statements. Make sure they're specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So make sure that you're really getting to what, how you are going to accomplish or this challenge or problem through the goals that you outline specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. More is not better. So don't feel like because someone's asking for goals that you need to list 20 goals out. You know, pick your top three and go with them. Um, more goals, more objectives doesn't always mean better. The narrative of your program, of your grant application. Plan of action, it's your project design or methodology. It's often the most detailed and lengthy section. What specific activities will allow you to meet your goals and objectives? So this is where you outline those specific activities there. Typically, they are task oriented. They're specific and detailed within the narrative. And it's essential that you demonstrate all of the steps necessary to complete the project with each of flowing logically from the previous. So don't make it complicated. You know, how are you going to approach the audience? How are you going to implement the program? How are you going to evaluate and how are you then going to communicate the successes? You know, write your narrative in a natural and logical flow of the program. Questions to think about when you're putting your narrative together. What significant needs are you trying to meet? What is the current status of those needs? Will this project help you meet the need? What really 
um, what needs really, what really needs to be done, what services will be delivered to whom and by whom, is it possible to make some impact on the problem, what gaps currently exist in the knowledge base, and what does the literature say about the significance of the problem at the local, state, regional, and national level? So these are all just questions to think about when you're putting your narrative together. Also in the narrative, through the different fields, walk the reader through your specific project. Describe the activities as they relate to the goals. How will those activities be conducted? And when will those activities be conducted? So timeline time line and time expectations are important. How long will it take you to deliver this program? Who are you delivering the program to? Where is the program taking place? What facilities are being used? So all of these specifics, the who, the how, when, where, what, those are all specific things that should be covered within the narrative. Also make sure that you've done your homework as I've mentioned, make sure that you're prepared to enter metrics somewhere if they're not specifically asked for in your grant proposal. What are the number of people being served by your organization as a whole? What are the number of people that you've engaged or will engage in this project? What are the number of youth that you're engaging in this project? How many hours per person will these people be engaged throughout the life of the project? How many partners are being included? What are the metrics of the population, as I've already mentioned? And what are, what are other numbers that might be requested by the funder that you learn about in that RFP or grant information page? Not only should you know these metrics going into the application, but most likely you're gonna be responsible for delivering these metrics in any type of mid-year or final reporting as well. So you need to know the metrics. The budget. As you're developing your budget, make sure that you're being realistic and don't inflate. I love a budget that's asking for $4,932.27. When someone's asking for just $5,000 or a really round number, that means they're literally just asking for the max amount that they can ask for. Um, so I really like to see a realistic budget dollars and cents. Be specific. As I mentioned, think about that cost per participant. You know, really think about how much is it costing to get an individual outside and create behavior change? You know, does it make sense? And justify if it makes sense and why. Uh, there are two parts to a budget. Um, the line items, which breaks the budget into spe spe specific categories. And sometimes in addition to the line item budgets, you're required to provide a budget narrative that explains how you got to those figures and how you're really gonna spend the money. So that's not always required, but sometimes you'll see the line item as well as the budget narrative. Also, there's two types of costs to consider, direct and indirect. So make sure that um, when you're asking for funds and you're looking at the, the funder, um, are you asking for direct program costs, meaning costs that can be identified specific to specifically to a program element, um, or is it an indirect cost, meaning going towards overhead and administrative costs? Um, and I'll tell you that in my world, most of the time we do not allow overhead. You know, if you're asking for $5,000 or $10,000, specifically it needs to go to direct on the ground program costs. Um, but make sure that you're looking at those budget requirements. When you get into the larger grant amounts, oftentimes there will be a percentage that's given that can go towards overhead. So for example, if you're asking for $25,000, 10% or 15% can go towards keeping the lights on, administrative costs, um, things that aren't direct program programmatic elements. So look at those program requirements and make sure you're aware of what's, what's allowed and what isn't and what you're asking for from your program staff as well. Also, is there a cost share or match? So funders like to see that an institution is putting funds into the project as well. Sometimes there's a match. So a 50% match for a $100,000 program would be $50,000. A 50% cost share of the total project cost where the funder puts up $100,000 is $100,000 because 50% is $200,000. So just, again, look at the match requirements and make sure that your math makes sense. If there's a one-to-one -one match and you're asking for $25,000, that means the overall cost of your project is $50,000. So again, make sure that you're aware of these uh, match requirements. Timeline, make sure that your grant timeline and your programmatic timeline match up and they meet the requirements of the funder. 
Make sure that the timing of the receiving funds align with your project plans and goals and make sure all the reporting dates are on your radar. Is there a mid-year report? Is there a conference call? Is there a final report? Make sure all of those timelines align. Oftentimes, again, you're requested or we request letters or photos or other miscellaneous items. These are not always required. If they're not required, don't send them. Oftentimes people are like, oh, I didn't see it asked for, but I have a great picture or I have that letter of support. If it's not asked for, there's a reason. So try not to send those materials if you can help yourself. If they are required, look at how they should be received and don't send extra. Before you submit your proposal, review the grant criteria. Make sure that you edit your proposal. There's a fine balance between wordiness and being too brief that equals clarity. So make sure that you take the time to proofread and edit your proposal. When you're editing your grant, after you have finished your draft, set it aside for a day. You know, walk away from it, have a glass of wine, and then come back to it. Revise it. Don't ever write it one time and never revise. Have someone else on your team read it um, without taking notes. Just read it and give their gut reaction and then have them tell you what your project is about. So if someone is able to read your grant proposal and then be able to really tell you what your program is trying to accomplish and what's it all about, you're looking pretty good. If someone reads it and doesn't really know what you're asking for, then you need to go back and revise. Edit for clarity and consciousness. Make sure that you're not using jargon, you're not writing in first person, cut the fluff, put sentences in a logical sequence, Make sure you're using good action verbs in your writing. I have never read in first person again, so obviously I want that, that to be important. Um, and then use lists when you have several items. So don't be afraid to bullet things out as well as use paragraph form. And the very last minute, a crisis on your part does not constitute a crisis on my part. So just kind of keep that in mind, have a backup plan. If something happens to you that day, who can submit that grant for you if you're not available? So just remember, a crisis on your part doesn't mean it's a crisis on the funder's part. So as far as formatting and a type, typing checklist, adhere to the character limits, address all sections of the guidelines and review them, address um, the review criteria, meaning what is the funder looking for when reading your grant application, make sure that the, ballot, uh, the budget balances out, proofread and spell check, and check for uh, if there's duplicate du a duplication process. So uh, can you duplicate your grant um, proposal? Can you use it multiple times? Just a kind of a checklist to see, can you submit more than one? And then you did it. After that whole process, you finally get to submit your grant and that's a really good moment. It's kind of like taking an exam, good or not, you can submit your grant and feel good and walk away if you've gone through these steps. So. Um, thank you so much. I hope you got good, good information from this. We're going to take some questions. Um, but before I stop talking, uh, just two things I want to point out. Um, this was kind of focused on how you write a proposal. On June 4, on March 14th, please join us. Um, I'll be giving another webinar with TYO at 10 a.m. specific standard time on March 14th, focused on 2018 funding opportunities um, that might come really helpful for you throughout the year. So there's a good hand full of grant programs that I manage and I'll also be talking about some that I'm aware of and I'll give you the, the details behind each of those. You can contact me at my email address or visit our website for more, more information. So with that, I've got five minutes left. Questions? <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Um, we will try to get through these questions. And uh, just so you know, we haven't uh, put out the RSVP link for that March 14th webinar, but uh, we will be sending that out to everybody. So keep an eye out your, in your email for that. Um, and this has become an annual webinar that we do with Ivan. So always lots of good opportunities in there. Okay, so questions. Um, here's a couple, let's see. Um, so I'm. So there was a question about the brief overview of funding opportunities with Outdoor Foundation. I'm going to put that one on hold because that March 14th webinar is what it will go over all of those funding opportunities. So question for you, do foundations hold records of prior grant proposals? Would they recognize reapplication of grants? I think you addressed that a little bit, but maybe we can go over it again. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would say that I remember word for word, um, but I do, I definitely know those organizations where I'm like, didn't I just read that um, last time? Or I will go back and see, okay, who's 
this organization? How many times have they applied? Have they been approved for anything? Have they been declined? And then if they've been declined, what do they get declined for? So, I mean, we have a grant database and I do use that when I have questions. Great. And then there's a question that's kind of also related. When talking about partners or sponsors, how should you answer if you've submitted the proposals to multiple organizations and don't have an answer from the organization yet? So if there, if yeah, if, I think transparent. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. Go, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I would say that transparency is key. You know, be as honest with the information that you have. If you have put out um, proposals out there and you just don't know the answer yet, that's great. I want to know that. I want to know that you're trying to secure the funding and kind of who you're trying to secure the funding from. Um, you know, not often is it dependent on those other funders unless there's like a match requirement. So I think the more transparent and honest you can be, uh, the better. Great. Somebody wanted to know, um, how do we figure out what answers need more expansion? Examples of like bulleted questions versus a paragraph. Yeah, I mean, use your gut, honestly. I mean, I think for, for all questions, try to be specific in detail, but also be brief as, uh, as well. Um, you know, I think that anytime there's a list of maybe like more than two or three elements, like you're bulleting, you where in your mind, you're thinking about them as bullets, then I would take the time to bullet them out in the application. Otherwise, um, write it in a more of a formal paragraph form, um, unless you kind of get to two or more, and then, I, then I'd start to bullet things out. Great. Um, and so just so you guys know, we'll go a little bit over time if we need to, and everyone will get sent a recording of this webinar. So if you do need to bounce off at 11 um, for work commitments, we totally understand, but just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so for many foundations, the grants are invitation only. How do we get on the invite list? Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, in my world, none of the grants are really invitation only, but the best way is to say, hey, add me to your announcement list so that um, we get those grant announcements. And I get those every single day. People that are like, hey, I have a question or can you just make sure I'm on your list? Um, so just kind of play dumb. You know, for who cares if there's an invitation only or not? The Worst thing someone can do is say no. Um, so reach out to the individual and say, hey, I'd love to hear about grant opportunities. Um, and let's kind of see what response you get. It's either going to be, thanks, we'll put you down, it's invitation only, or I'll definitely add you to my to my list. So again, in my world, most of these are open opportunities. There's not an invitation only requirement. Great. And is there an average money, like average amount for a grant request? Or is it just... Yeah, you know, it's different for everybody. I think that when you're dealing with private foundations or family foundations, you're probably dealing with larger pots of money. I will tell you a lot of the funding opportunities that I work with within the, the outdoor industry, there's just not big pots to dip into. So a lot of the grants that I deal with are $5,000, $10,000. There have been bigger ones that are 15, 20, 25,000, um, but those are pretty isolated opportunities. So. I would say between five and 10,000 is probably the average. Great. Um, let's see, good ones. Uh, what do you mean by adding population metrics? Do we say we are trying to serve 2% of the, you know, black, white, Mexican population in this region or city or area? No, I think it's more about saying not, oh, I'm trying to serve 2% of this type of population, but in, in my community, it's 90% African American, or in my community, it's 50%, um, you know, low income, or whatever the, the terms that you're using, or the community that, that I'm serving, there's a 20% LGBTQ population. You know, I think those are the kind of metrics, like, who are you gener generally trying to serve? And as much information you can give about those populations, the better. Great. Uh, do you use a particular scoring matrix with related criteria to determine grant awardees? Um, the answer is yes and no. For half of the opportunities, I have a scoring rubric. And honestly, some of them, it's the yes, no, maybe. Um, you know, is, is it my gut where, yeah, this is an awesome program, um, or clearly it doesn't meet the criteria and it's a no, or there's a maybe. And I, I like the yes, no, maybe, because it creates more of like a general conversation that you can have with your review team versus being dictated by a score. Um, but it really is funder dependent. So I, I work in both worlds, both rubrics and the yes, no, maybe process. Great. Somebody asked if we were going to make the PowerPoint slide available. And yes, we can make this uh, deck available to you on TYO. Um, so, and we will uh, get that up there. So yeah, uh, we'll get that from 
open and we can share it. Um, are there directors of philo uh, philanthropy and how do you find them? Directories, sorry, did I say directories? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> the answer is, you know, with, yes, with the typical foundation, you're definitely gonna have a, a grant program officer um, or director of philanthropy or something like that. Um, when you're looking at brands, so, so at least again, in my world in the outdoor industry, the reason that we manage these grant programs are because it's the marketing person, the social media person, someone that has many titles to their name and um, grant maker philanthropy is not in it. Um, and so in most of these funding opportunities, these brands do, do not have um, a giving officer. Um, I am that give, giving officer for most of these grant programs. Great. Um, and yes, this webinar is recorded and anyone who's on here will be getting a recording. That was just a quick, easy one to answer. Uh, any advice on writing goals, outcomes, outputs, and how to tell them apart? Um, for sure. So I would, I mean, your goals and your outcomes, you know, it's kind of like goals and objectives. Goals are a little bit more broad. Objectives are a little bit more specific. Both are written as smart statements. Um, I mean, it's kind of just different terminology, honestly, when you say goals and outcomes, um, you know, a lot of times th those are kind of the same thing. Um, so try to be as simplistic as possible um, and use the terminology used in the application. It'll say goals or outcomes and just use the terminology as appropriate. All right, I'll unmute for a second. Um, any tips for getting an all volunteer grant writing group with minimal experience to be motivated to get the grants done? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, the promise of drinks after the application is written is probably always a, a daily happy hour. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, it's gotta be if they're volunteers, um, then they should be doing it because they're mission driven. And it, honestly, I mean, kind of that intrinsic, um, I'm into it type of attitude is probably what's really needed um, or getting them excited about who the funder is, the brand that's a potential partner. Um, but hopefully, you know, if they're volunteering to write the grant, then it's kind of all in. You can't volunteer, but not be into it. So make sure you have the right people in place. Great. Should a nonprofit put focus on grants for their current programs and projects or spend the time and effort to fund a new one? What do you see more success with? I mean, I think that aligns with the priorities of the organization. I mean, I think that I, I have personally been in organizations where they're victims of constantly creating something new. Um, and then it, that's hard because you're constantly creating something new. I think that it's better to invest in a program that evolves over time and that you make appropriate changes based on evaluation and and just lessons learned um, versus creating something new all the time. I mean, at some point, something always starts new and fresh. But I think that, um, you know, to start to invest in a program where you already have success and you're now looking to make it more successful um, is often very appealing. Great. Um what if we don't ask our audience how they identify should we in terms of knowing the audience diversity i mean you should have some sort of idea of how do i define your audience and because you're going to need it at some point whether you have a board other funding opportunities whether it, or an individual giving at some point you're going to have to know the information about the people that you're serving so do your due diligence you know be broad and general and look at the census um, study or get specific and start surveying your participants and get the data on your own. But at some point, you have to know your audience, good or bad. Great. Is there, this is a million dollar question, is there a website or someplace similar that sort of has a clearinghouse of where people can find opportunities for grants? And that would include international opportunities. Yeah, well, for sure, I mean, what I can provide is the list of um, funds and, and opportunities that I manage, and you can find that at outdoorfoundation.org. Um, if you, once you go to outdoorfoundation.org, you'll see a menu where it says grants. Um, you can click there. It is kind of based on 2017 opportunities, but that gives you a good idea of what will be taking 
place in 2018. And I'll be updating the website in the next over the next 30 days as a lot of these opportunities launch in the spring. So outdoorfoundation.org um, is probably a good place to start. Perfect. All right, a couple more. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is my bad. So in this kind of, I think, goes along that. Are there directories? Are there directories of philanthropy? I think I said directors of philanthropy, and how do you find them? And I think the question was more, are there directories of philanthropy, which is sort of kind of goes back to that hub for grants and stuff. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely directories of, um, like, of, you know, grants.gov. Now, those are more federal related grant opportunities, but there are definitely clearinghouses um, that kind of showcase, um, you know, different funding opportunities, um, grants.gov for federal opportunities. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head just because I'm drawing a blank, but Google, like Google outdoor funding opportunities, and you'll be amazed at what comes up and the things that you don't even know that are out there. So Google can be a really great tool for that. Probably not the best answer, but that's a great tool. Awesome. All right. Last but not least, we're crushing it. Uh, would, <laughs> crushing the questions. What would be your recommendation for persuading funders into your program? Peer review, literature, organizations, data, and successes, et cetera. Gosh, I mean, I think, you know, research is great, but don't go overboard. I mean, again, all the research is going to do is show us what we already know. I mean, we know the research, which is why these opportunities are available. So I think really specific anecdotal type of things that you can add to your proposal versus research. You know, I want to know about the, the, the girl who has never been on a bike before and now knows how to ride her bike and has developed a lifetime skill. I want to know about the individual who never felt like there was an opportunity to go camping because no one looked like them. And now there is because of being engaged in your program. I mean, I think that anecdotal type of information, it goes a lot further than, than specific research and peer reviewed um, sources because um, we, we know that information already. I mean, we, you're convincing the course. Awesome, thanks Ivan. And actually one more quick one. Um, do you have a good place to start for local grants? Um, you know, honestly, I would, I would, I would say Google again. I mean, really talk to look, look up locally, Virginia. I mean, Vir there's a Virginia outdoor foundation that offers grants for Virginia based, you know, outdoor programs. So, um, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, a place to go that would point to specific local opportunities, but just doing a little bit of legwork and research on your end, look, look up the foundations that are based in your hometown or in your metropolitan area. And that's a great place to start. And that information is easily accessible online. Fantastic. Yay, we got through all the questions. Thank you guys, everybody who joined us. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times already, we will be sending out a link to a recording of this webinar. You will automatically get it if you are signed up. Um, and for future reference, we do that for people who are signed up or who may have missed it due to other obligations. So you will get that recording. We will also put up the PowerPoint presentation on TYO probably by the end of the week. Um, so please just be patient, but it will end up there so that you can reference it as well because um, there's a ton of amazing information in there. So Ivan, thank you so much. This was extremely thorough and extremely informative. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great afternoon or morning. Thank you.